really need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal okay. Valenza. I'm Dave Debo. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. If we're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truths. And this particular space on WBFO is called Buffalo What's Next. Good morning to you. I'm Jay Moran and uh, very pleased to have with us from Best Self Behavioral Health there, uh, Chief Operating Officer Kelly Dumas is with us and also Kevin Beckman, Vice President of um, uh, Health Home for uh, Best Self Behavioral Health. Uh, good morning to both of you. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning. Good thank morning. you for having us. All right. Well, thank you very much because obviously so much of what the origins of this program are about is, are the issues from May 14th and the lingering issues of May 14th. And we find out that mental health is a key issue here that uh, has really come exposed, I think, to a certain extent since May 14th. Let's just talk about that. Maybe if we can think back to before May 14th, Mm -hmm. the reality of mental health and mental health care Mm -hmm. in the black community in, Mm -hmm. in Buffalo. How could you maybe describe it then and maybe talk about it since? Yes, I think prior to May 14th, there has been kind of a a disconnect between the mental health system and uh, the black community. So I know um, uh, many in the black community probably look to other ways to address mental health needs and not uh, so trusting of mental health system, health care system in general, and for good reason. Um, So there, you know, there is a lot of stigma around seeking mental health treatment and services. So as you mentioned, after the with with the massacre of May 14th, of course, the need uh, to have that kind of mental health support was just exasper exasper exasperated. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And and there was still a need prior um, however, I don't think many were really seeking the mental health treatment. But um, with that that incident occurring, it was just magnified and kind of on fire. And we really needed um, some mental health supports. And was it uh, when it comes to the black community, was it more difficult perhaps maybe for black men to seek help as compared to black women? Or is it both kind of the same? I, I think as a whole. It was very challenging, to say the least, prior to um, the racist attack. Um, one of the things that the the attack brought to light was some of the challenges with the community. Um, I was talking with some other members of the community, and I was talking about... Um, the deserts that exist within the community, right? Yeah, we're um, talking about food deserts, but food there's desert, more, there's more than resource that. resource and access and services. Um, so she rightfully corrected me, and she said, um, it's not a desert, it's apartheid. Thank you. I was just right? about to say that. Yes. Right. Yeah, so right. because she said, you can do something. I mean, you know, yes. a, a desert is a natural, natural occurring that's event. Right. Apartheid is a systematic yeah. Mm-hmm. A set of parameters mm-hmm. that are imposed right. on a population yes. and or location. Right. So this particular apartheid was was imposed mm-hmm. both on the population mm-hmm. and the location. Right. Yes. So back to tops is that was the only major supermarket in the community. And you layer that on with all the other resources healthcare, services, um, access to groceries, you know, um, services within your community. That existed prior to, and it still exist. Mm-hmm. But I think we at Best Self are trying to make efforts with some other community representative to, to kind to, to kind of uh, rectify that. But, but that existed prior to. So those mm-hmm. barriers to accessing care were already there prior to. Um, so just like Kelly stated earlier, so they were apprehensive on mm-hmm. this, on the part of community members, specifically black black males, um, but even if they wanted to access health care, it was very little 
or inadequate. And with that, and I'm going to quote you from an article in the Buffalo News, uh, Kevin, uh, there's also what exists for a black man when he walks into any place. Mm. The assumption yep. that perhaps maybe they're, quote unquote, either angry or dangerous. Correct. Um, right there, that brings up all sorts of questions, doesn't it? I mean, just first, first and foremost, just that relationship between the counselor or even somebody who's just greeting somebody at the door to bring them in with the, the prospective patient or client. Um, right there, there's, there's already a barrier. Oh, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that when I was interviewed for that article, and I wanted to very, high, very much highlight that we, um, as black men, are not angry or dangerous because we have a tendency to put people into buckets. So that individuals who's walking through that door receiving services, if you have those assumptions already that this person who is experiencing the same thing, some mm -hmm. of the same challenges, right? So we think about depression, um, loss of interest of things that I want to do, agitation, um, um, difficulty sleeping, right? Difficulty focusing. He's experiencing this, that like any other human being, yes. right? But if we have that particular lens that those are all because he's either angry or dangerous, how much help is he really going to receive, right? So we have to be careful of some of those perceptions. That's why we do an assessment. You come in, you find out what that individual is looking for, what they are in need of, mm -hmm. and then we try to move to um, provide those particular services. But we can't move past that if your assumption is that that black male who's coming in for services is angry or dangerous, we have all five senses. You know why we have all five senses just like you do? Because we're all human beings, mm -hmm. right? Right? So me, as a black male, I feel the same pain, the same hurt, the same anxiety as any other individual. However, I can feel your disapproving disappro eyes. I can feel when you're dismissing what I'm saying, right? If I'm telling you that I had difficulty sleeping or I miss my mom who, who passed away, you know, right before COVID, and you'll say, oh, did you have a good relationship with her? Well, I just told you I miss her, right? Right. So it's, it's those things that we have to be mindful of because as part of that system mm -hmm. of apartheid, it, it prevents us from wanting to access the care that mm -hmm. we need. Um, earlier, um, we talked about um, suffering in silence, right? So we will find a way to mm -hmm. tough it out. Yep. No one, it's not like a playbook in the African-American community. We're black males where we all sell each other, okay, page five says <laughs> tough it out, right. we don't mm -hmm. cry, right? Um, just like with trauma, right, you have to protect your core. Right. So if any um, person is coming in after a traumatic event and they become hyper vigilant, so one little sound or door slamming and they are jumpy, we all wrap our, our supportive um, um, arms around that person, except for when it's a black male. Right. So we disapprove. He can't feel those things. So he's he's traumatized. He's walks into a place. He's going to protect his core, right? Mm -hmm. I am re-triggered here because of all of these things. Then I just won't go, right? But then we label it as, oh, they they want to tough it out. No, they want to help. They want to feel better. Mm -hmm. They they they, they want to stop crying, right? They want to they want help. Um, so we have to make sure that we are coming with the proper lens. And that's why I want to be very clear on that statement, why I said it then and why I want to say it now. We are neither angry or dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yet, there's that sense probably, that, like you said, the the, the glance, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the whatever the case may be, that you, know, you, the person walking in, the black man walking in, has to already probably has that self-consciously inside them that, oh yeah, yeah you, you're, you're judging me. Absolutely. So one of the things that um, I, I talked about following um, the top shooting is that this sense, so I'm going I'm to I'm go first person now. So I, I've always felt as if symbolically I had a target on my back. Um, so when we walk around, it's the clutching of your purse. You have nothing I want, right? <laughs> right? right. I, 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 my kids in college, just like your kid, right? I'm trying to 
figure out how to pay for their cell phone bill and their car note, right? I'm, I'm f- figuring out a vacation and backpacking across Europe like you talked about, right? <laughs> so, I don't know. However, you, you, you labeling me, I'm walking in, right? Kelly and I are walking, I have a suit on, she has a formal dress, she's CEO, and I'm, I'm the VP of, of one-fifth of some of the services that the Best Self is offering, and you're clutching your purse. And you're 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 um, moving away. You're crossing over. Now I understand. I have daughters. You always want to do things to make yourself feel better. Right. But if I can differentiate um, between services and and um, situations where where it's a little more risky, I, I think you can. Right. I, I do not think every white guy is a racist. The one who attacked pops is. So I have to differentiate, right? I walked in here to our studio, said hi to you. I, was, I wasn't on guard. But if I walk into the studio, and everybody in the studio, because mm-hmm. I'm a black male, is now on guard. If you're not going to like me, make it for cause, right? <laughs> right? He's a jerk. He's saying bad things, right? Or he's, you know, you know I, I done something to offend you. But on par, just walking into a room, I'm often judged, so that literal target was always on my back. What happened after Tops? It was like, oh, right, it's actually a target on my back. Kelly, um, we talked about the apartheid Mm -hmm. of services that are Mm -hmm. available in the Mm -hmm. uh, east side of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, as the COO, Mm -hmm. that's part of what Mm -hmm. you kind of have to organize, right, Mm -hmm. to try to make Mm -hmm. break down those barriers yes i was sitting here thinking as i'm listening to kevin in regards to the apartheid the lack of resources and services in a community and how that contributes to um people's state of mental health so what we know is that when you lack those resources when people don't have those basic needs available to them healthy food um access to gainful employment um Community, uh, community centers, child care, things in a regular thriving community, that's going to impact, that's going to negatively impact mental health. So many of our black communities, sadly, they, they you know, Jefferson um, was one that mirrored this lack of resources and we have others. Um, so I do think, yeah, now there's a lot of conversation and talk in regards to how we go move forward as a full community to address that and change that Um, because we can do all the mental health counseling and treatment that we want. But if people's condition does not change their mental health, it will improve slightly because again, we have to make sure people have access to basic resources um, and to them in their community. On that note, and I try to leave that this type of question toward the end of these programs instead of the beginning, but just since since you brought it up and, and, because you guys have been so active here over the last three months. Mm -hmm. Is there a sense that there's maybe um, a little bit more of a commitment to changing some of those conditions? Is there a sense of that? Or or maybe are we already seeing fall back into a state of normalcy, if that's a Uh, term? What I will say from where I sit, I know that there are ongoing communications about that. There have been many verbal commitments to shifting that um, from local, uh, state, and federal government um, because to make those changes, it will require investment of dollars. I haven't seen much movement beyond the conversation, so I am very Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will get there. Those conversations are still happening. Um, One of the pieces that concern me a bit is in the discussions, there really has been a lot of discussions around how we empower um, our grassroots. But we have a ton of services and providers who who are able to bring these resources, who look like the community there, but they're they're doing it on a smaller scale. How do we empower them to um, uplift them and, and put them in, in a place to be able to, to serve and, um, and sustain? Um, and that takes resources in advance. And so 
that's been difficult. Um, a lot of the conversations I'm hearing, it's like maybe looking for some of this work and this shift and change to happen uh, prior to actual dollars coming. And that's very hard sure. for grassroots and small. Um, so I'm still pushing one of the messages that I shared with um, some of my um, um, some of the uh, white accomplice individuals and people who who were asking, how can we support her? I think that we have to make sure that we continue to be vocal. And I think we need our white allies and accomplices, our brown, everyone to continue to say and demand that we need this to look differently, to be differently and not let it die you know and so i think there's a lot of us still trying to make sure that happens but i definitely would like to see more white voices kind of demanding that and saying we we can't let this is a moment this is a movement and now is the time and so let's let's do this now and do it right i would agree completely with kelly um for one very important reason is that there has been a shift in the community in terms of the narrative around <clears throat> um, mental health services. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm getting a lot of one-offs. Um, in particular, um, my wife is a Buffalo school teacher. Um, she works at School 31 and, and been there for a number of years. We bumped into an administrator um, um, yesterday and that person, they were talking about the hope that they have for their school year. Um, and the person didn't know what I did for a living. Um, and then naturally, the discussion shifted to mental health. Um, and then I plugged in. Um, but prior to plugging in, she said, M people are, are talking about mental health more mm -hmm. following the events um, at TOPS. So here's a person that mm -hmm. I had no connection with. Um, and we just bumped into out in the community and she said the narrative has changed. So she's a principal at, at, a, at a middle school. Someone who has a certain feel and tie for various members of the community. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So again, we can take that opportunity and move forward. Mm -hmm. And this is why I said I agree with Kelly, because we need to make sure that the infrastructure mm -hmm. is in place so that so that we can support the the, 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 the grassroots and the, the narrative that's out there that folks are okay now with at least talking about the need mm -hmm. for mental health services publicly. I'm glad you said infrastructure. I want to get into that as we move through. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that this is Buffalo What's Next and WBFO. Our guest, Kelly Dumas, she is the uh, COO for Best Self Behavioral Health and Kevin Beckman, Vice President of Health Home for Best Self Behavioral Health. Infrastructure, I, I'm I want to reflect a little bit about this because we heard about um, counselors being at Johnny B. Wiley mm -hmm. at the corner of uh, Jefferson and Best right away. But I think it was on you know, uh, May 14th was on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. On Sunday, they were there. But at the same time, there's an interesting backstory about infrastructure and how a lot of movement had to happen to make this to get it really kind of going off the ground because mm -hmm. of some real structural problems that we've already talked about mm -hmm. right here, just when it comes to, you know, when people were invited to come to mm -hmm. Wiley mm -hmm. for help, for mm -hmm. mental health counseling of some regard, they ran into some issues mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that w created a lot of barriers. Yes. So actually, I will say the counselors were, uh, we and a number of us were there May 14th. Um, within an hour of the incident occurring and then um, transition to Wiley um, as well as a couple other locations to provide support. Um, I think, and I'm sorry, I lost track. Well, just the I, idea that, well, okay, that people were walking in and maybe not necessarily satisfied with what they were experiencing initially. Yes. Initially, I know, um, and we have great uh, community um, um I guess, mid to large scale providers uh, who, who responded, some responded and were there, but they did not have professionals who looked like the community. So there was a, a quite a strong reaction to that and a demand for the need. Um, you know, in times like what occurred, um, it was very important for those immediately impacted and hurting and just 
there was so much uncertainty. People needed to see people who look like them. There was a sense of comfort and safety. There was a lot of, um, I think as a community, we tend to be um, communal in some ways. So just wanting to come together and sit and cry and know that there are some things that you can have unspoken. And I don't have to explain or worry about being judged. I can express my anger and frustration and not feel like I have to censor myself because I don't want to offend someone or someone may take my comments wrong. And so it was just more comfortable to have black mental health professionals. So I know we had to pivot quickly um, because the initial response, um, it looked a little different. And so um, the community was definitely letting us know uh, that this was not OK. And so I know as best self, we did have. So I got that call as I was watching the live Facebook feed of the incident occurring and trying to figure out in my head what I was watching and try to make sense of this. And then I got a call while I was looking at that, that Kelly the county called there's some shooting happening right now and they need mental health to come in are you and i'm like yes i think this is what i'm watching so i called kevin i called ty i I called a few people and i went right there and um and then they came also uh within the hour so we had a number of um licensed professionals on the site and we were kind of spread because it was just a hot You know, it was the crowd. So we were spread there. And then there was some transition to Wiley. But as people were coming to Wiley, um, we had the other agencies there supporting, too. And um, there were a lot of white professionals uh, trained in trauma and, I mean, highly trained and skilled professionals. Um, However, that's not what was what was needed at that time. So we had to have that conversation as providers, We had to go to the conference room immediately as there were lots of reactions. It's like, whoa, we got to huddle and got to switch. And we have to make sure that our black mental health professionals are visible and seen and out front because that's what's needed. And how do we change this? So I think we work together um, to make that happen. Best Self was able to bring t- about 30 of uh, black mental health professionals and some of the other agencies didn't have any or had a few, which was fine. But then we talked about how you can, how those other professionals could still support in this because we needed all hands on deck, right. but it's just where on the deck those hands needed to be. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. That, that, that was a beautiful way of saying it. It's where on deck where yes. those hands needed. Yes. Um, and and just to pivot shortly, um, it, it, what we did started before um, Sunday. Um, like within an hour, um, I was on scene, um, responded to Kelly's request. Um, didn't know what we were walking into. Mm -hmm. Um, Kelly then deployed um, uh, probably half of her resources at the time um, um, to um, Wiley. Um, So I was on scene at Wiley um, probably to about midnight. Mm -hmm. Um, And what the community was asking for actually started at Wiley. Mm -hmm. Um, I was interviewed recently and the person said, well, I need to know specifically who in the community asked as if it was a community representative or a politician. I was saying, and I, and I was, and, I, and you know, and I, I don't want to say, um, okay, so I'm in the middle of a disaster, right? And I have, um, literally, I have, I have, I have families falling apart. Um, I'm, I'm with um, detectives and and Kelly was like, you have to partner with the detectives for the notification because families are falling apart because, you know, it was a lot happening. Um, and I was like, yeah, no, it wasn't um, a unanimous vote. And they didn't huddle together and say, we're going to cast it. But it was clear. It was oh clear. My goodness. They said what they wanted. Right. Mm-hmm. So when I was talking with individuals and I was saying things like, oh, I'm glad you're here because you understand. Mm-hmm. Or it was some of the folks who would. Um, just see me in tops. That particular tops was also my grocery store. Um, so they would see me and say, "Oh yeah, you're that, mm-hmm. you're that counselor." Mm-hmm. Or people would come and say, "Kev, right? Kev the counselor." I was like, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm glad you're here talking to me." And I would, and I was walking around with some mm-hmm. of our um, very supportive um, white counselors. And who I've partnered with on other mm-hmm. um, events, and they would say, "Can I just talk to you, Kev?" Mm-hmm. And that person 
pivoted nicely and say, how about I get some water? Let me get you some food. Mm-hmm. And so so that person was running. So when Kelly said it's it's where the hands on deck, mm-hmm. what they were doing was so important in the moment. So it actually started Saturday. So it wasn't like a, a politician saying, no, the community said, mm-hmm. this is what we want. Partly in, because of two events. One, um, the shooting was racially motivated. It was more than apparent, right? Um, we could not control social media or the narrative. It was out there. Kelly, um, and, and, and I pray for Kelly all the time because she was, was witnessing it even prior to, um, and so was everyone else. So that's the first layer. It was, it was right. that. And then the second layer was, we talked about earlier, they may have had some interactions with trying to attempt to link with services that may not have been really helpful or beneficial, right? Mm -hmm. So that they were apprehensive. So we showed up and it's like, oh no, you might get it, right? Because, you know, Mm -hmm. you're from the community. And it was a couple other counselors who also, that was their tops or their community. Mm -hmm. Um, Talika Pope in in particular, I have to uh, mention her. She was instrumental in the community providing services and support and name recognition well in advance of this. So they saw us Mm -hmm. and said, I'm okay with talking to you. And it it spilled over to the following day at Wiley because they wanted to come in and cry, right? And um, if they didn't see someone um, who looked like them, they were a little uncomfortable because they didn't want to be judged, Mm -hmm. right? They didn't want to say, you know, they wanted to cry. Or maybe just have a sandwich. Mm-hmm. They they just wanted those things. They they didn't want it to be formalized, mm-hmm. right? And we didn't need someone at the door saying, "So okay, what is your name and what are you looking for?" And how mm-hmm. they wanted to just walk in. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of that is from the community. So it's it's. I often say that Kelly and I are, are churched. So the African American, <laughs> we call it the Black Church, right? right? Yeah. In the Black Church, <laughs> those things. So, so the pillars in the community, in the absence of all those mm-hmm. resources, um, the church and faith communities will often attempt to fill the void. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the places that they will go and have those moments where they can, they can just debrief mm-hmm. and cry That's and right. feel safe. So their so their initial. Uh, um, um, presentations to Wiley was for that. Mm-hmm. So we had to pivot to make sure we mirrored what mm-hmm. the community was asking for, right? Because there was a lot of discussion about when the community asked for this. And, and it was like, yeah, it, it, it makes sense if you peel one layer back. Mm-hmm. If you take a step back and go, kind of makes sense what they were yep. looking for. We're going to take a, a quick time out on Buffalo mm-hmm. What's Next. We'll pick up where we left off with uh, this. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. WBFO is a unifier, a place where people can come together to learn about politics, health care, schools, climate, and social and racial justice. That mission is secured for future generations when listeners give a gift through their will. For more information, contact Colleen Miller at 716-845-7031 or cmiller at wned.org. Thank you. Watch the WNED PBS original production, Frederick Law Olmsted, Designing America. What his parks are all about is finding immensely practical solutions to the problem of building a dream in the middle of a city. Frederick Law Olmsted, Designing America, now streaming on YouTube and the PBS video app. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And uh, back on Buffalo, what's next? Uh, with us from Best Self Behavioral Health, there's COO Kelly Dumas and also Kevin Beckman, uh, their VP of uh, Health Home. Uh, I want to go back, if we could, or just maybe use it as a, as a starting point with a, another conversation here, talking about the response both at TOPS on May 14th and also what was going on at Wiley, not only on the 15th, but moving forward and, and was there for, for uh, some time. We've had this discussion here about talking about May 14th, are we lingering too long on the violence that happened there that day and the suffering and the sadness, or is it an important part 
of the grieving process here for the community to continue with us because it is something yeah. that people are very sensitive to. I, I, I would oh. say that we are not lingering too mm-hmm. long on that. Um, one of the things that I truly appreciate um, Best Self is that racial um, inclusion and equity is, is a part of the very fabric of what Best Self um, is and does. Um, so I appreciate having that particular lens. So we, you, you need to park over an issue as long as it takes mm-hmm. in order to address it. That's right. The second thing to that is that we almost can't heal because now it's intergenerational trauma, right? Or racialized trauma. And the reason I liked uh, this particular segment is because um, throughout history, there have been episodes. Um, In one interview, I talked about the the, the Tuskegee um, experiment. Um, In particular, my my daughter, who's a history major at Buff State, um, completing her master's, and her master's thesis is on the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, But in doing her research, we often also talk about some of the experiments that happened um, on black men, Um, which means one generation ago, right? Right. My daughter, who is uh, in the master's program at Buff State, right, was touched physically, right, held by someone who was at Tuskegee. Right. So so it's not that long ago. Right. Um, And then we often talk about what happened in in Tulsa and the individuals who are now um, 105 years old and we're still fighting that one. So that narrative is there. So then we fast forward to to tops and we want to move past tops quickly. Mm -hmm. Then we hear on Saturday that the pastor was arrested in I think it was Mississippi or Alabama for watering his neighbor's flowers. His his neighbor went out of town. Neighbor said, "Hey, look, why while I'm away, can you water my flowers?" I I, I do that, right? I, I love my garden. I love my grass. Um, so so we recently had an irrigation system put in. So that's not unheard of, mm-hmm. right? Someone else who was not a part of the conversation called the police and said, there's a guy over there watering the lawn. The police actually responded to that, which is a whole other issue. So, so again, the, the intergenerational trauma, right? So, so I'm, I've been traumatized by history because again, I know individuals who were in Tuskegee, right? I learned about what happened in Tulsa. Then there was the Buffalo Tops massacre, right? And just when I'm starting to feel a little better, there's a black guy, he gets arrested for watering flowers. And here's the kicker. His wife comes out and said he had permission. The person who called the police then came out and said, oh, I didn't recognize you. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, that is the neighbor. Mm-hmm. The police officer said, I can't unarrest you. Still, the charges mm-hmm. later dropped. But what is the message? So mm-hmm. so here we are, three months past tops, and folks are now asking, um, are we lingering there too long? Well, no, because the whole thing about trauma is that it doesn't follow a prescribed time. Right. It is the it was needed is a set of tools, resources and support Mm -hmm. It's, it's not timed. So we can't move past this until. Right. It is fully addressed and the individuals are are still reaching out and seeking services. Like I said earlier, that principal said that from her lens, she's hearing from the African-American community that it's now okay to seek those services. Mm -hmm. So we have to still park there for a little while um, until we are offering all the supports long gone, uh, long ongoing Mm -hmm. um, and all of the infrastructure. And to that, Mm -hmm. we talk about this. So the principal saying there's more of an interest, there's more of an awareness of mental health, but it's showing up, though, in people seeking counseling and Mm -hmm. counseling appointments or whatever type of uh, I guess, matri- uh, metrics we could use here? Uh, you know, I think that there's more of a narrative, definitely in the black community around the need. Um, and 
I think we have to stay here as long as we need to and not put a, a time limit or parameters around when it's time to move on for all the reasons Kevin state. And um, I think this is also for the black community, maybe an opportunity to get it right in terms of mental health supports and what that needs to look like so that it can be healing and, and beneficial to the community. So, for example, this weekend, Best Self sponsored the Funk Fest, uh, which is very big in the black community. But we're looking for opportunities to go out and engage specifically the black community around the importance. So I was able to address the audience a couple of times just to talk about the importance of mental health, just like your physical health mm -hmm. and why we need to address that. And as providers, we have to make sure that we are incorporating practices that are therapeutic and healing with the, tri quote, traditional treatment. So we're really doing work to see how we can change how mental health looks so that it is more inviting to the black community. Um, we, I want to uh, see us bringing groups and uh, we're uh, talking to other agencies, organ small organizations to see how we can maybe bridge and bring in drumming and different types of uh, indigenous type practices. Um, into treatment to do that. So I think staying here and using this time because we as a society have been through so much COVID, all kinds of things. And then as the black community has been um, heightened. So I think it gives us an opportunity to really talk about how important mental health is and people are listening. And that's interesting. And, and that brings me to this question. Both of you can, mm -hmm. and the, the, like you said, you were speaking to people and, mm -hmm. and, what what was resonating? What were there certain topics or hot buttons that you said that just when when you started getting the the, the feedback mm -hmm. that showed you that yeah th these these are the things that are really yeah. triggering. Hey, triggering is probably the wrong word, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but uh, that are just re people are responding to. I think I've I have personally had a number of people that came up to me after that, and then what seeing. Um, me and the community, especially when we sometimes I have on my best self shirt, so if they know who I am, they'll come up and they'll start talking about, you know, them thinking about mental health counseling or having a loved one. A lot of people concerned with their children and wondering, you know, if there is someone um, that maybe they could speak to. So it's kind of like a, a an interest to see if this is going to help. And I'm trying to uh, balance that with sometimes as a as a licensed provider, we have a ton of paperwork <laughs> to get someone in. So we have also been looking priceless. at how can we, you know, when someone wants counseling, we want them to be able to get to that without. So how can we cut through some of that traditional entry piece so that we don't lose them? And when someone starts saying, I don't know, or I didn't, you know, if, can I talk to you? Are you a counselor? I don't do a lot of individual counseling anymore. I'll do some, but then I'll try to link them with, I'll ask them specifically what they're looking for. If it matters that it's a clinician of color, I'll make sure that we get them to that. And then we want to get them linked as quickly. So I have personally experienced, I actually had internal uh, conversations about us setting up um, so that we can start tracking and looking at, because the way it is now, people coming into our system, they're just coming in. We're not tracking in terms of if they're coming through some of these efforts that we have specifically through the mental Black Mental Health Support Team. So we're going to start taking a look at that. Um, I've also had some requests um, in regards to churches and religious or did come talk and uh, speak in regards to mental health. Um and we are working on a process internally so that once we start um, increase, I anticipate to see an increase of um, individuals coming and having specific requests. Like I want a clinician of color. What is our process to respond to those requests so that we can link people and not have them lost in our uh, large system? So sure, yeah. <laughs> sure. So you've, you've you've drawn them in a little bit, but yes. you don't want to let them. We don't want to lose people. So it, I think it's coming together, and I'm hoping um, we'll. We need to be able to collect data. I would like to see us move the needle. And really uh, look at we have data in terms of what our pop our demographics look like um, racially broken down, and I would like to see that increase. It, it's not it's not huge for the black community and brown community. It's it's not good. 
Um, I can't think right yeah, but now. But it's, it's below the, uh, it's, the the average, I guess. Of, well, um, I think an citizens. average, if you look at the black brown community um, engaging in mental health treatment, it's it's lower just because of the stigma and some okay. of the things that we talked about. So I am hopeful that we'll um, see some kind of change in that. It's hard to say yet what that could what that will look like. But we are being intentional about our outreach. Um, about making sure we are offering easy and quick access to services when someone says they want to speak to someone. And we also, we have peers and non-licensed, like traditional clinical staff who kind of do the initial engagement stuff. And then um, once someone's like, yeah, I think I might, then we want to get them linked where they can start getting that more um, traditional type. I hate using that word. I'm sorry. No, no, because some know. of the things, because yeah. well, we, we have all, we all we all can see, right? We, right? We've seen the TV shows. You yeah. know, I walk into the office. There's the receptionist. Yes. The, oh, the doctor will see you now, yes. right? For the next yeah, 15 right, minutes, right. tell me your problems, yes. right? We, yes, we, yes. We, that we got to kind of push that aside. Yes, right? that's right. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's the opportunity of now. Is how I look at it, right? So, so you have to you have to move while you have that opportunity. That's right right in front of you now and what kelly was speaking of earlier um in terms of that um, care coordination um, of services and, and providing whatever that individual is in need of at that moment. Mm -hmm. That's why we had peers mm -hmm. <clears throat> and targeted case managers and mm -hmm. care coordinators along with outreach workers and licensed staff right. um, because it was whatever that individual mm -hmm. needed. So if they needed um, water, we we, we help with the coordination of that. And then from those conversations, it was, um, you know, maybe I can talk with someone. So I would mm -hmm. get a lot of emails about um, um, someone who we provided some outreach services for, whether it was food or linkage. Um, we, we assisted with getting individuals either minutes for their phones or or phones because so they can communicate because again losing tops created a, a, a vacuum mm -hmm. um, and then from those conversations it was you know I may be interested in some services and we wanted to be able to make sure we not only track that but then we make sure that door is open for them and it, there's not a lot of, of barriers that are created by the system it's things that we have to do um, in order to onboard a person, um, but there's some things that we just do. So we we had to 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 look at streamlining what we mm -hmm. do so we can we can help them. Um, and and I think Kelly and Best Health in particular was very very good with being able to pivot in the moment. Mm -hmm. And we are talking uh, with uh, folks from uh, Best Health uh, Behavioral Health. Uh, Kelly Dumas is the COO, and also uh, Kevin Beckman, the VP of uh, Health Home for. Best self behavioral health. Um, just to flash back, and like you said, you, you couldn't wait for people to come to the office and set up appointments and all that. You, you went mm -hmm. and, on a grassroots effort right off the bat. Uh, you're right there on the, on uh, on the tops grounds on May 14th. Um, without getting too specific, mm -hmm. I, I'll leave this to you. But can you talk about the emotions that you heard then or are still hearing? about May 14th from members of the community? Oh, well, I could, I know I, even being at the Funk Fest this weekend, I have spoke to a few people who were there and just still, um, I mean, this is, it, it's, it's not that long ago. Uh, there are still people who are not um, comfortable coming outside of their homes. So I think when we talk about, you know, is this is this long enough and it's time to move on, people are still yeah. hurting. And so um I mean I've I've listened to people's stories and accounts in terms of what they're feeling and how life is different now. Um I actually uh we're working um we have a community meeting so uh the resource center on ferry um, has been identified as the resiliency center moving forward. So what I learned through uh, this tragic event is when um, incidents like this occur throughout the country, there is usually um, the federal government comes and sets up a resiliency center. So that's and that's for long term ongoing services, whatever those services and supports need to look like. So um, best self and I am overseeing the mental health 
component of that within the community. So, uh, and we have like four subcommittees to there, but uh, they're gonna we're gonna have a community meeting um, on the thirtieth uh, of August, and there's three scheduled. But it's really to continue to hear the voice of the community in terms of what's needed, what resources and um, supports they have access, what do they feel they have needed and haven't been able to access so that it can inform us as we continue to create the plan of what's needed moving forward. But I mean, and I'm sure you've spoken to people as well in yeah. terms of um, what people are still experiencing, but it's still very real for many of us. I would agree. Very um, consistent um, responses that I'm, I'm hearing. Um, um, even well after uh, three months. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we had a mobile. Um, we had mobile services prior to this. We still have mobile services. So, we we have people who can go into the home um, um, to provide counseling. We have a whole team of mobile services for those who have barriers to coming into traditional clinic. Whether that's because they just, uh, it could be transportation or it could be. Um, they're just not ready to come into a, a traditional, there we go again, right. clinic but, service. But again, we, we go to them. Right. So we're we're working with that team as well to continue. So it was snug, actually. They had sent us over a list of, and this was probably like a month after they sent us like a list of, um, I think it was like 40 individuals. They had been doing some street canvassing outreach, and these were individuals who had identified as wanting counseling. And what we learned was, because it was about a week old when we got it from when they did it, and then when we reached out, many of them, they didn't want it anymore. So they had either changed their mind or was some wrong number. So there were a handful that we connected with. But so we're trying to always figure out how we can do. I mean, what we know about any kind of treatment, you have to strike. When someone says, I want counseling or I want this, you have to get it right now. So how can we then put you right now in connection with, with this treatment before you, you know, you change your mind? So I think it's an ongoing trying to figure out how we best position and work with other providers so that, you know, people are getting what they need when they need it, you know, in the moment. Um, we have same day access uh, already that we had prior to this. So how do we ensure that is true to the entire community and even those who have barriers and can't physically get into where we are? How can we get to them and reach them? Agreed. Um... And then the other thing, um, it's planting a, a seed, right? Um, sometimes we may only have three sessions, mm -hmm. right? Can we plant and water a seed so that that individual later on may say, you know, um, that self um, treated me with respect. They were very kind. Um, I was always, mm -hmm. I'm like the encourager. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's kind of my role. You know, yeah. you know, I'm always checking in with folks. How you doing? Yes. Right? <laughs> we did it the other day. Right. right. right? We, we were, we were um, out in the community. A guy walked up and I'm over there engaging, ran and got him some water. You know, I have no idea, you know, if our paths may cross again, but, but, but that's what we have to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so sometimes is the opportunity of now you have to strike where the that's iron and right. have all these analogies. I, I just happen to like, you know, the opportunity of now, yeah. um, Linda Beckman 101. So because then later on, right, that, that seed is planted and then that individual may come back and they'll that's say, right. you know, I, I saw Kevin and he, <laughs> and he said he was from best self. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe somebody over there can help us, yep. you know, so that is what we're doing. So, so we have to stay parked on this event mm -hmm. for as long as necessary, right. right? Because we are not seeing the full impact mm -hmm. um, of this yet, right? It's only three months, you know, and, and, the holidays are coming up. I literally was talking with someone on mm -hmm. Saturday who was the daughter of one of the the, the victims. And um, we were at a birthday party. Um, birthday parties are triggering. One of the individuals from the event was picking up um, either a cake or cupcakes or some items um, for uh, a birthday party, right? So we, we this is this is still ongoing and active for a lot of members in the community mm -hmm. right so so 
will be here um, for a while mm -hmm. um, dealing with this. There was an individual who um, recently spoke before Congress or maybe even on CNN, and I think it was um, Sandy Hook. Maybe it was Sandy Hook, one of the, one of the students, mm -hmm. um, because I think there was a court case recently right. um, who was saying that it was still challenging for them. So if it's, if it's, if it's okay mm -hmm. for that person right. to say it's still challenging for me after several years, I, I think we can, we can be a little patient mm -hmm. with the African-American community, in particular the individuals who were directly affected by the TOPS and those indirectly affected with TOPS, mm -hmm. right? Because it's only been three months. I, I think it's okay for us to park over that event mm -hmm. and make sure we're providing to support for the community long term. Right. Do you, just to follow up on that, do you see any issue then or, that this becomes a, a rallying cry of sorts for this city? It, not just Eastside community, but this city, that this, this is a uh, critical event in the history of the city. Mm -hmm. And that, and even we know how when things become a rallying cry, it becomes mm -hmm. not necessarily commercialized, but it becomes, it just becomes its own type of uh, wave. Is there a concern about that? That, that there could be too much of that, that it might seem too over the top, that it might be, uh, people might be taking advantage of it to a certain extent. And again, I'm talking about more of a general thing, not talking about mm -hmm. people who are suffering inside the community. I'm just talking about that idea, like we were talking, mm -hmm. the conversation we wanted to continue, you know, but for some people, this, this is a, and I'm not talking about black people, I'm talking mm -hmm. about white people in this community, mm -hmm. this event is something that, you know, has outraged them, understandably mm -hmm. so. And I think want to carry it moving forward. Mm -hmm. is, what about that thought? I mean, I, I being kind of clear with that question is it's a, it's a, a vague concern, I guess. Well, some of the thoughts that come to my mind as I'm listening to you, I don't know if I'm getting to the heart of what you're asking is, as you said, this was an outrageous event and it requires an outrageous response. So in thinking in terms of, I guess, could it be is, you know, the concerns of being over the top or people taking advantage I haven't really gotten a, a sense of that yet. Um, you know, you hear little things here and there, but I think um, the other side of that coin far outweighs that, you right. know. And I think that we have to focus on that and not be distracted by, you know, by that other piece of it. And it's like we need an over the top <laughs> loud voices, consistent voices demanding as a community we want to see this look different and just really supporting that and not being distracted and the few there will be instant instances of people taking advantage that's just i don't think I, that I, can no, be avoided it, it can't be avoided um and from my particular lens what i've seen is the the, the love um from the community mm -hmm. um it, it it was it was the community on par not showing hate in response to hate. Um, you know, to quote King, um, hate, you, you can't overcome hate with hate. Mm -hmm. Only love can do that, mm -hmm. right? Darkness cannot dispel darkness. Only light can do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've seen um, on, on par, even in the middle of um, our um, mental health response to first aid when we were at um, Wiley, not Wiley, when we were at Mikowski, the, the, the first event that happened at uh, the, the Mikowski School at the corner of Bess and Jefferson. Um, even in the middle of that, you know, and, and utter heartbreak, it was still love mm -hmm. and not even the anger in general towards like, you know, everybody who was white. Mm -hmm. It was anger at that person. Well, how could that person hate us that much and then drive all the way here to do that? That's what I've seen. I, I had a discussion with someone recently and I said that we need more of that because what typically happens if is as African-American male, if I was to unfortunately do something to you, 
the, the historical narrative is that you hate all black males, right? You say, I can't believe I, I that, that, you know, Kevin did this thing to me. He cut my flowers or something. Mm-hmm. Clip your roses, Water right? Water your lawn. Uh, water, yeah. Water's your lawn. Yes. Water's your lawn, right? And then, Sorry. This, right, right, right? Because that's how absurd it is, right? right. Mm-hmm. Um, then you will hate all black males. But if you do something to me, I only hate you and your family, right? But then, even in that, I'm not even seeing that because I've been seeing a lot of love. Sometimes it's not returned in kind. So, so it hasn't been from the community that's using it as a right uh, a, a rally cry. We're not fundraising for um, particular extremist events um, off of that. We're, we're not seeing that. If that's out there, yeah, it's there. It, that's the condition I think which led to um, someone driving several hours for whatever reason. Um, so, no, I, I haven't seen that, um, and I don't think we will see that. Um, I think the community wants to to just heal. Um, they want support. So what we're hearing is what Kelly said. They want um, for things to be different, right? We want services in the community. We want grocery stores. We want um, effective um, policing, right? We want you know our response time for firefighters and and the paramedics to be um, you know within minutes, like the national average, right? Right. And and, and on a side note, from watching what other communities have done um, afterward, because now we're plugged in, right? I have this experiential knowledge, right? I wish I didn't have to learn it, but I now know it. So I have a particular lens that I look at the rest of the country with, right? So I look at what happened in Uvalde. I look what happened in, in Illinois. Uh, the response time to TOPS from Buffalo Police was fantastic when you look at what other communities have done, right? That's very true. Right? So this is what we want, right? We want we want the right response to the right event at the right time with the right people. That's right. That's what we want. So so if somebody's taking this thing and they turn into a rally cry for some other, it, it's not us who's doing that. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, we're coming down to just a, a couple of more minutes here. Um, actually, two more minutes. So I'll maybe allow each of you to, to take a, a minute for yourself here. But what about for you? You're the you're the mental health practitioners, mm-hmm. but yet you're part of the part of the community as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how have you how have you uh, approached this for yourself? While you're advising other people to take a check of their of their mental health. I just looked at the clock. <laughs> it's <a> two minutes. <laughs> so. I'll briefly say that um, it's been difficult. I, I know initially, and I personally have done some transition with this. I think to respond, it required a significant level of numbing and... Um, um, with stuffing and all that stuff that sometimes we have to do to get through things. Um, definitely have a lot of great family, friends, support, and even colleagues. And we try to check in on each other. Um, and so I know I have definitely been um, looking at, because we have to take care of ourselves before we take care of others. So I know I've been looking. We have some, this Sawubona Healing Circles. It's something I just recently went through to get certified in. And Sawubona means I see you. It's an African-centered base group kind of intervention. And that's been very healing to be in those spaces. So I think being intentional and, re- and reminding ourselves and we try to remind each other uh, as professionals, black professionals in terms of this, how important it is to take that time out and, and take care of ourselves. Kevin, you got the final word. I, I would agree with Kelly. Um, so the, the, the senior leadership for, for Best Self is a, it's a fantastic group of individuals. And we do try to check in with each other and really be there for each other. And um, so I was smiling when Kelly said that because I, I will go and check in, right? Yes. And, and Kelly will, um, as our, our as our leader, will say, I'm compartmentalizing this. <laughs> she would say, the, in the middle of that, right? So we were responding, and she said, I said, Kev, uh, Kelly, I need to check in with you. She goes, I don't have time to check in. I was like, oh, 
You know, I, you forget I'm a counselor too. <laughs> so, so I sat Kelly down. I was like, yeah, we need a moment, and, then, and vice versa. So, so, so we do check in with each we other. Do. Yeah, so it is very important. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for sharing with us today. Kelly Dumas is the COO of Best Self Behavioral Health. Kevin Beckman is the VP of Health Home for Best Self Behavioral Health. Appreciate your your comments and your advice and sharing with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. This has been Buffalo What's Next. We'll be back with you again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock right here on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOL in Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown.